The Beetle Horde Conclusion Tommy Travers and James Dodd of the Travers Antarctic Expedition crash in their plane somewhere near the South Pole and are seized by a swarm of man-sized beetles. They are carried down to Submundia, a world under the Earth's crust, where the beetles have developed their civilization to an amazing point, using a wretched race of degenerated humans whom they breed as cattle for food. The insect horde is ruled by a human from the outside world, a drug-doped madman. Dodd recognizes this man as Bram, the archaeologist who had been lost years before at the Pole and given up for dead by a world he had hated because it refused to accept his radical scientific theories. His fiendish mind now plans the horrible revenge of leading his unconquerable horde of monster insects forth to ravage the world, destroy the human race, and establish a new era, the era of the insect. The world has to be warned of the impending doom. The two, with Hadia, a girl from Submundia, escape and pass through menacing dangers to within two miles of the exit. There, suddenly, Tommy sees towering over him a creature that turns his blood cold, a gigantic praying mantis. Before he has time to act, the monster springs at them. Chapter 7 Through the Inferno Fortunately, the monster miscalculated its leap. The huge legs, whirling through the air, came within a few inches of Tommy's head, but passed over him, and the mantis plunged into the stream. Instantly the water was alive with leaping things with faces of such grotesque horror that Tommy sat paralyzed in his rocking shell, unable to avert his eyes. Things no more than a foot or two in length, to judge from the slender, eel-like bodies that leaped into the air, but things with catfish heads and tentacles and eyes waving on stalks. Things with claw-like appendages to their ventral fins, and mouths that widened to fearful size, so that the whole head seemed to disappear above them, disclosing fangs like wolves. Instantly the water was churned into phosphorescent fire as they precipitated themselves upon the struggling mantis, whose enormous form, extending halfway from shore to shore, was covered with river monsters, gnawing, rending, tearing. Luckily, the struggles of the dying monster carried it downstream instead of up. In a few moments the immediate danger was past, and suddenly Hadia awoke, sat up. "'Where are we?' she cried. "'Oh, I can see! I can see! Something has burned away from my eyes. I know this place. A wise man of my people once came here and return to tell of it. We must go on. Soon we shall be safe on the wide river. But there is another way that leads to here. We must go on. We must go on. Even as she spoke, they heard the distant rasping of the beetle legs, and before the shells were well in mid-current, they saw the beetle horde coming round the bend. In the front of them Bram, reclining on his shell couch, and drawn by the eight trained beetles. Bram saw the fugitives, and a roar of ironic mirth broke from his lips, resounding high above the strident rasping of the beetle legs and roaring over the marshes. "'I've got you, Dodd and Travers,' he bellowed, as the trained beetles hovered above the shell canoes. "'You thought you were clever, but you are at my mercy.' Now's your last chance, Dodd. I'll save you still if you'll submit to me, if you'll admit that there were fossil monotremes before the Pleistocene epoch. Come, it's so simple. Say it after me. The marsupial lion. You go to hell, yelled Dodd, nearly upsetting his shell as he shook his fist at his enemy. High above the rasping sound came Dodd's shrill whistle just audible to human ears, though probably sounding like the roar of thunder to those of the beetles, 
there was no need to wonder what it was. It was the call to slaughter. Like a black cloud, the beetle shot forward. A serried phalanx covered the two men and the girl, hovering a few feet overhead, the long legs dangling to within arm's reach, and a terrible cry of fear broke from Hadia's lips. Suddenly Tommy remembered Bram's cigarette lighter. He pulled it from his pocket and ignited it. Small as the flame was, it was actinically much more powerful than the brighter phosphorescence of the fungi behind them. The beetle cloud overhead parted. The strident sound was broken into a confused buzzing as the terrified, blinded beetles plopped into the stream. None of them fortunately fell into either of the three shells, but the mass of struggling monsters in the water was hardly less formidable to the safety of the occupants than that menacing cloud overhead. "'Get clear!' Tommy yelled to Dodd, trying to help the shell along with his hands. He heard Bram's cry of baffled rage, and looking backward could not refrain from a laugh of triumph. Bram's trained steeds had taken fright and overset him. Bram had fallen into the red mud beside the stream, from which he was struggling up, plastered from head to feet, and shaking his fists, and evidently cursing, though his words could not be heard. "'How about your marsupial lion now, Bram?' yelled Dodd. "'No monotremes before the Pleistocene? Did you get that? That's my slogan now and forevermore.' Bram shrieked and raved, and seemed to be inciting the beetles to a renewed assault. The air was still thick with them, but Tommy was waving the cigarette lighter in a flaming arc, which cleared the way for them. Then suddenly came disaster. The flame went out. Tommy closed the lighter with a snap and opened it. In vain. In his excitement he must have spilled all the contents, for it would not catch. Bram saw and yelled derision. The beetle cloud was thickening. Tommy, now abreast of his companions on the widening stream, saw the imminent end. And then once more fate intervened. For leaping through the air out of the places where they had lain concealed, six mantises launched themselves at their beetle prey. Those awful bounds of the long-legged monsters the scourges of the insect world, carried them clear from one bank to the other, fortunately for the occupants of the shells. In an instant the beetle cloud dissolved, and it had all happened in a few seconds. Before Dodd or Tommy had quite taken in the situation, the mantises, each carrying a victim in its grooved legs, had vanished like the beetles. There was no sign of Bram. The three were alone upon the face of the stream, which went swirling upward into renewed darkness. Tommy saw Dodd bend toward Hadia as she lay on her shell couch. He heard the sound of a noisy kiss, and he lay back in the hollow of his shell with the feeling that nothing that could happen in the future could be worse than what they had passed through. Days went by days when the sense of dawning freedom filled their hearts with hope. Hadia told Dodd and Tommy that according to the legends of her people, the river ran into the world from which they had been driven by the floods ages before. There had been no further signs of Bram or the beetle horde, and Dodd and Tommy surmised that it had been disorganized by the attacks of the mantises, and that Bram was engaged in regaining his control over it but neither of them believed that the respite would be a long one, and for that reason they rested ashore only for the briefest intervals, just long enough to snatch a little sleep and to eat some of the shrimps that Hadia was adept at finding, or to pull some juicy fruit surreptitiously from a tree. Incidents there were, nevertheless, during those days, for hours their shells were followed by a school of the luminous river monsters, which nevertheless made no attempt to attack them. And once, hearing a cry from Hadia as she was gathering shrimps, Dodd ran forward to see her battling furiously with a luminous scorpion eight feet in length. 
that had sprung at her from its lurking place behind a pear shrub. Dodd succeeded in stunning and dispatching the monster without suffering any injury from it, but the strain of the period was beginning to tell on all of them. Worst of all, they seemed to have left all the luminous vegetation behind them, and were entering a region of almost total darkness in which Hadia had to be their eyes. Something had happened to the girl's sight in the journey over the petrol spring. As a matter of fact, the third or nicotating membrane which the humans of Submundia possessed, in common with birds, had been burned away. Hadia could see as well as ever in the dark, but she could bear more light than formerly as well. Unobtrusively, she assumed command of the party. She anticipated their wants, dug shrimps in the darkness, and fed Tommy and Dodd with her own hands. God, what a girl, breathed Dodd to his friend. I've always had the reputation of being a woman-hater, Tommy, but once I get that girl to civilization, I'm going to take her to the nearest little church around the corner in record time. I wish you luck, old man, I'm sure, answered Tommy. Dodd's words did not seem strange to him. Civilization was growing very remote to him, and Broadway seemed like a memory of some previous incarnation. The river was growing narrower again, and swifter too. On the last day or night of their journey, though they did not know that it was to be their last, it swirled so fiercely that it threatened every moment to overset their beetle shells. Suddenly, Tommy began to feel giddy. He gripped the side of his shell with his hand. Tommy! We're going round! shouted Dodd in front of him. There was no longer any doubt of it. The shells were revolving in a vortex of rushing, foaming water. Hadia! they shouted. The girl's voice came back thickly across the roaring torrent. The circles grew smaller. Tommy knew that he was being sucked nearer and nearer to the edge of some terrific whirlpool in that inky blackness. Now he could no longer hear Dodd's shouts, and the shell was tipping so that he could feel the water rushing along the edge of it. But for the exercise of centrifugal force, he would have been flung from his perilous seat, for he was leaning inward at an angle of forty-five degrees. Then suddenly his progress was arrested. He felt the shell being drawn to the shore. He leaped out and Hadia's strong hands dragged the shell out of the torrent, while Tommy sank down, gasping. "'What's the matter?' he heard Dodd demanding. "'There is no more river,' said Hadia calmly. "'It goes into a hole in the ground. So much I have heard from the wise men of my people. They say that it is near such a place that they fled from the floods in years gone by.' "'Then we're near safety,' shouted Tommy. That river must emerge as a stream somewhere in the upper world, Dodd. I wonder where the road lies. There is a road here, came Hadia's calm voice. Let us put on our shells again, since who knows whether there may not be beetles here. Did you ever see such a girl as that? demanded Dodd ecstatically. First she saves our lives, and then she thinks of everything. Good Lord! She'll remember my meals, and wind my watch for me, and, and... But Hadia's voice, some distance ahead, interrupted Dodd's soliloquy, and, hoisting the beetle shells upon their backs, they started along the rough trail that they could feel with their feet over the stony ground. It was still as dark as pitch, but soon they found themselves traveling up a sunken way that was evidently a dry water course and now and again Hadia's reassuring voice would come from in front of them. The road grew steeper. There could no longer be any doubt that they were ascending toward the surface of the earth, but even the weight of the beetle shells and the steepness could not account for the feeling of intense weakness that took possession of them. Time and again they stopped, panting. We must be very near the surface, Dodd, said Tommy. We've surely passed the center of gravity. That's what makes it so 
difficult. Come on, Hadia said in her quiet voice, stretching out her hand through the darkness, and for very shame they had to follow her. On and on, hour after hour, up the steep ascent, resting only long enough to make them realize their utter fatigue. On because Hadia was leading them, and because, in the belief that they were about to leave that awful land behind them, their desires lent new strength to their limbs continuously. Suddenly, Hadia uttered a fearful cry. Her ears had caught what became apparent to Dodd and Jimmy several seconds later. Far down in the hollow of the earth, increased by the echoes that came rumbling up, they heard the distant, strident rasp of the beetle swarm. Then it was Dodd's turn to support Hadia and whisper consolation in her ears. No thought of resting now. If they were to be overwhelmed at last by the monsters, they meant to be overwhelmed in the upper air. It was growing insufferably hot. Blasts of air, as if from a furnace, began to rush up and down past them, and the trail was growing steeper still and slippery as glass. "'What is it, Jim?' Tommy panted, as Dodd, leaving Hadia for a moment, came back to him. "'I'd say lava,' Dodd answered. "'If only one could see something. "'I don't know how she finds her way. "'My impression is that we are coming out through the interior of some extinct volcano.' "'But where are there volcanoes in the South Polar regions?' inquired Tommy. "'There are Mount Erebus and Mount Terror in South Victoria land, active volcanoes discovered by Sir James Ross in 1841, and again by Borgrevink in 1899. If that's where we're coming out, well, Tommy, we're doomed, because it's the heart of the polar continent.' We might as well turn back. But we won't turn back, said Tommy. I'm damned if we do. We're damned if we don't, said Dodd. Come along, please, sang Hadia's voice high up the slope. They struggled on, and now a faint luminosity was beginning to penetrate that infernal darkness. The rasping of the beetle legs, too, was no longer audible. Perhaps they had thrown Bram off their track. Perhaps in the darkness he had not known which way they had gone after leaving the whirlpool. That thought encouraged them to a last effort. They pushed their flagging limbs up, upward through an inferno of heated air. Suddenly Dodd uttered a yell and pointed upward. God! ejaculated Tommy. Then he seized Dodd in his arms and nearly crushed him for high above them a pinpoint in the black void they saw a star. They were almost at the earth's surface. One more effort, and suddenly the ground seemed to give beneath them. They breathed the outer air and went sliding down a chute of sand and stopped, half buried at the bottom. Chapter 8 Recaptured "'Where are we?' each demanded of the others, as they staggered out. It was a moonless night, and the air was chill, but they were certainly nowhere near the polar regions, for there was no trace of snow to be seen anywhere. All about them was sand, and here and there a spiny shrub standing up stiff and erect and solitary. When they had disengaged themselves from the clinging sand, they could see that they were apparently in the hollow of a vast crater that must have been half a mile in circumference. It was low and worn down to an elevation of not more than two or three hundred feet, and evidently the volcano that had thrown it up had been extinct for millennia. Water! gasped Dodd. They looked all about them. They could see no signs of a spring anywhere, and both were parched with thirst after their terrific climb. "'We must find water, Hadia,' said Tommy. "'Why, what's the matter?' Hadia was pointing upward at the starry heaven and shivering with fear. "'Eyes!' she cried. 
big beetle eyes waiting for us up there. No, no, Hadia, Dodd explained. Those are stars. They are worlds, places where people live. Will you take me up there? asked Hadia. No, this is our world, said Dodd, and by and by the sun will rise. That's a big ball of fire up there. He watches over the world and gives us light and warmth. Don't be afraid. I'll take care of you. Hadia is not afraid with Jimmy Dodd to take care of her, replied the girl with dignity. Hadia smells water. Over there. She pointed across one side of the crater. There we'd better hurry, said Tommy, because I can't hold out much longer. The three scrambled over the soft sand, which sucked in their feet to the ankle at every step. It was with the greatest difficulty that they succeeded in reaching the crater's summit, low though it was. Then Dodd uttered a cry and pointed. In front of them extended a long pool of water with a scrubby growth around the edges. The ground was firmer here, and they hurried toward it. Tommy was the first to reach it. He lay down on his face and drank eagerly. He had taken in a quart before he discovered that the water was saline. At the same time, Dodd uttered an exclamation of disgust. Hadia, too, after sipping a little of the fluid, had stood up, chattering excitedly in her own tongue. But she was not chattering about the water. She was pointing toward the scrub. Men there, she cried. Men, like you and Tommy, Jimmy Dodd. Tommy and Dodd looked at each other, the water already forgotten in their excitement at Hadia's information, which neither of them doubted. Brave as she was, the girl now hung back behind Dodd, letting the two men take precedence of her. The water, saline as it was, had partly quenched their thirst. They felt their strength reviving. And it was growing light. In the east, the sky was already flecked with yellow-pink. They felt a thrill of intense excitement at the prospect of meeting others of their kind. "'Where do you think we are?' asked Tommy. Dodd stopped to look at the shrub that was growing near the edge of the pool. "'I don't think. I know, Tommy,' he answered. "'This is a wattle.' "'Yes?' "'We're somewhere in the interior regions of the Australian continent.' and that's not going to help us much. Over there! Over there! panted Hadia. Hold me, Jimmy Dodd. I can't see. Ah! This terrible light! She screwed her eyelids tightly together to shut out the pale light of dawn. The men had already discovered that the third membrane had been burned away. We must get her out of here, whispered Dodd to Tommy. Somewhere where it's dark before the sun rises, let's go back to the entrance of the crater. But Hadia, her arm extended, persisted. Over there! Over there! Suddenly a spear came whirling out of a growth of wattle beside the pool. It whizzed past Tommy's face and dropped into the sand behind. Between the trunks of the wattles they could see the forms of a party of blackfellows watching them intently. Tommy held up his arms and moved forward with a show of confidence that he was far from feeling. After what he had escaped in the underworld, he was in no mood to be massacred now. But the blacks were evidently not hostile. It was probable that the spear had not been aimed to kill. At the sight of the two white men and the white woman, they came forward doubtfully, then more fearlessly, shouting in their language. In another minute, Tommy and Dodd were the center of a group of wandering savages. Especially Hadia, three or four gins, or black women, had crept out of the scrub and were already examining her with guttural cries and fingering the hair garment that she wore. Water, said Tommy, pointing to his throat and then to the pool with a frown of disgust. The black fellows grinned, 
and led the three a short distance to a place where a large hollow had been scooped in the sandy floor of the desert. It was full of water, perfectly sweet to the taste. The three drank gratefully. Suddenly the edge of the sun appeared above the horizon, gilding the sand with gold. The sunlight fell upon the three, and Hadia uttered a terrible cry of distress. She dropped upon the sand, her hands pressed to her eyes convulsively. Tommy and Dodd dragged her into the thickest part of the scrub, where she lay moaning. They contrived bandages from the remnants of their clothing, and these, damped with cold water and bound over the girl's eyes, alleviated her suffering somewhat. Meanwhile the black fellows had prepared a meal of roast opossum. After their long diet of shrimps, it tasted like ambrosia to the two men. Much to their surprise, Hadia seemed to enjoy it, too. The three squatted in the scrub among the friendly blacks, discussing their situation. "'These fellows will save us,' said Dodd. "'It may be that we're quite near the coast, but, anyway, they'll stick to us, even if only out of curiosity. They'll take us somewhere. But as soon as we get Hadia to safety, we'll have to go back along our trail. We mustn't lose our direction. Suppose I was laughed at when I got back, called a liar. I tell you, we've got to have something to show, to prove my statements, before I can persuade anybody to fit out an expedition into Submundia. Even those three beetle shells that we dropped in the crater won't be conclusive evidence for the type of mind that sits in the chairs of science today. And speaking of that, we must get those blacks to carry those shells for us. I tell you, nobody will believe. What's that? cried Tommy sharply, as a rasping sound rose above the cries of the frightened blacks. But there was no need to ask. Out of the crater, two enormous beetles were winging their way toward them, two beetles larger than any they had seen. Fully seven feet in length, they were circling about each other, apparently engaged in a vicious battle. The fearful beaks stabbed at the flesh beneath the shells, and they alternately stabbed and drew back, all the while approaching the party, which watched them petrified with terror. It was evident that the monsters had no conception of the presence of humans. Blinded by the sun, only one thing could have induced them to leave the dark depths of Submundia. That was the mating instinct. The beetles were evidently rival leaders of some swarm, engaged in a duel to the death. Round and round they went in a dizzy maze, stabbing and thrusting, jaws closing on flesh, until they dropped clothes locked in battle, not more than twenty feet from the little party of blacks and whites, both squirming in the agonies of death. "'I don't think that necessarily means that the swarm is on our trail,' said Tommy, a little later, as the three stood beside the shells that they had discarded. Those two were strays, lost from the swarm and maddened by the mating instinct. Still, it might be as well to wear these things for a while, in case they do follow us. You're right, answered Dodd, as he placed one of the shells around Hadia. We've got to get this little lady to civilization, and we've got to protect our lives in order to give this great new knowledge to the world. If we are attacked, you must sacrifice your life for me, Tommy, so that I can carry back the news. Righto, answered Tommy with alacrity. You bet I will, Jim. The glaring sun of mid-afternoon was shining down upon the desert, but Hadia was no longer in pain. It was evident that she was fast becoming accustomed to the sunlight, though she still kept her eyes screwed up tightly, and had to be helped along by Dodd and Jimmy. In high good humor the three reached the encampment, to find that the blacks were feasting on the dead beetles, while the two eldest members of the party had proudly donned the shells. It was near sunset before they finally started. Dodd and Tommy had managed to make it clear to them that they wished to reach civilization, but how near this was there was, of course, no means of determining. They noted, however, 
that the party started in a southerly direction. "'I should say,' said Dodd, "'that we are in South Australia, probably three or four hundred miles from the coast. We've got a long journey before us, but these black fellows will know how to procure food for us.' They certainly knew how to get water, for just as it began to grow dark when the three were already tormented by thirst, they stopped at what seemed a mere hollow among the stones and boulders that strewed the face of the desert, and scooped away the sand, leaving a hole which quickly filled with clear, cold water of excellent taste. After which they made signs that they were to camp there for the night. The moon was riding high in the sky. As it grew dark, Hadia opened her eyes, saw the luminary, and uttered an exclamation, this time not of fear, but of wonder. "'Moon,' said Dodd. "'That's all right, girl. She watches over the night, as the sun does over the day.' "'Hadia likes the moon better than the sun,' said the girl wistfully. "'But the moon not strong enough to keep away the beetles.' "'If I was you, I'd forget about the beetles, Hadia said Dodd. "'They won't come out of that hole in the ground. "'You'll never see them again.' "'And as he spoke, they heard a familiar rasping sound far in the distance. "'How the wind blows,' said Tommy, "'desperately resolved not to believe his ears. "'I think a storm's coming up.' "'But Hadia, with a scream of fear, "'was clinging to Dodd, and the blacks were on their feet.' spears and boomerangs in their hands looking northward out of that north a little black cloud was gathering a cloud that spread gradually as a thunder cloud until it covered a good part of the sky and still more of the sky and still more all the while that faint distant rasping was audible but it did not increase in volume it was as if the beetles had halted until the full number of the swarm had come up out of the crater. Then the cloud, which by now covered half the sky, began to take geometric form. It grew square. The ragged edges seemed to trim themselves away. Streaks of light shot through it at right angles, as if it was marshalling itself into companies. The doomed men and the girl stood perfectly still staring at that phenomenon. They knew that only a miracle could save them. They did not even speak, but Hadia clung more tightly to Dodd's arm. Then suddenly the cloud spread upward and covered the face of the moon. "'Well, this is good-bye, Tommy,' said Dodd, gripping his friend's hand. "'God, I wish I had a revolver or a knife,' he looked at Hadia. Suddenly the rasping became a whining shriek. A score of enormous beetles, the advance guards of the army, zoomed out of the darkness into a ray of straggling moonlight. Shrieking, the blacks, who had watched the approaching swarm perfectly immobile, threw away the two shells and bolted. "'Good Lord!' Dodd shouted. "'Did you see the color of their shells, Tommy?' Even in that moment the scientific observer came uppermost in him. "'Those red edges! They must be young ones, Tommy. It's the new brood! No wonder Bram stayed behind. He was waiting for them to hatch! The new brood! We're doomed! Doomed! All my work wasted!' The black fellows did not get very far. A hundred yards from the place where they started to run, they dropped, their bodies hidden beneath the clustering monsters, their screams cut short as those frightful beaks sought their throats, and those jaws crunched through the flesh and bone. Circling around Dodd, Tommy, and Hadia, as if puzzled by their appearance, the beetles kept up a continuous, furious droning that sounded like the roar of Niagara mixed with the shrieking of a thousand sirens. The moon was completely hidden, and only a dim, nebulous light showed the repulsive monsters as they flew within a few feet of the heads of the fugitives. The stench was overpowering. 
but suddenly a ray of white light shot through the darkness, and, with a changed note just perceptible to the ears of the two men, but doubtless of the greatest significance to the beetles, the swarm fled apart to right and left, leaving a clear lane through which appeared Bram, reclining on his shell couch above his eight trained beetle steeds. Hovering overhead, the eight huge monsters dropped lightly to the ground beside the three. Bram sat up, a vicious grin upon his twisted face. In his hand he held a large electric bulb, its sides sheathed in a roughly carved wooden frame. The wire was attached to a battery behind him. "'Well met, my friends,' he shouted exultantly. "'I owe you more thanks than I can express for having so providentially left the electrical equipment of your plane undamaged after you crashed at the entrance to Submundia. I had a hunch about it, and the hunch worked.' He grinned more malevolently as he looked from one man to the other. "'You've run your race,' he said. "'But I'm going to have a little fun with you before you die. I'm going to use you as an object lesson. You'll find it out in a little while.' "'Go ahead! Go ahead, Bram!' Dodd grinned back at him. "'Just a few million years ago, and you were a speck of protoplasm.' in that pre-Pleistocene age, swimming among the invertebrate crustaceans that characterize that epoch. "'Invertebrates and monotremes, Dodd,' said Bram, almost wistfully. "'The mammals were already extinct on the earth, as you know.' Suddenly he broke off, as he realized that Dodd was spoofing him. A yell of execration broke from his lips. He uttered a high whistle, and instantly the whip-like lashes of a hundred beetles whizzed through the darkness and remained poised over Dodd's head. "'Not even the marsupial lion, Bram,' grinned Dodd, undismayed. "'Go ahead. Go ahead. But I'll not die with a lie upon my lips.'" Chapter 9 The Trail of Death "'There's sure some sort of hoodoo on these Antarctic expeditions, Wilson,' said the city editor of the Daily Record to the star rewrite man. He glanced through the hastily typed report that had come through on the wireless set erected on the 36th story of the recording building. "'Tommy Travers gone, eh? And James Dodd, too.' There'll be woe and wailing along the Great White Way tonight when this news gets out. They say that half the chorus girls in town considered themselves engaged to Tommy. Nice fellow, too. Always did like him. Queer, that curtain of fog that seems to lie on the actual side of the South Pole, he continued, glancing over the report again. So Storm thinks that Tommy crashed in it? and that it's a million to one against their ever finding his remains. What's this about beetles? Shells of enormous prehistoric beetles found by Tommy and Dodd. That'll make good copy, Wilson. Let's play that up, hand it to Jones, and tell him to scare up a catchy headline or two. He beckoned to the boy who was hurrying toward his desk, a flimsy in his hand, glanced through it, and tossed it toward Wilson. "'What do they think this is, April Fool's Day?' he asked. "'I'm surprised that the international press should fall for such stuff as that.' "'Why, tomorrow is the first of April,' exclaimed Wilson, tossing back the cable dispatch with a contemptuous laugh. "'Well, it won't do the IP much good to play those tricks on their subscribers,' said the city editor testily. I'm surprised, to say the least. I guess their Adelaide correspondent has gone off his head or something. Using poor Travers' name, too. Of course, that fellow didn't know he was dead, but still. That was how the Daily Record missed, being the first to give out certain information that was to stagger the world. The dispatch, which had evidently outrun an earlier one, was as follows. 
Adelaide, South Australia, March 31st. Further telegraphic communications arriving almost continuously from Settler's Station, signed by Tommy Travers, members of Travers' Antarctic Expedition, who claims to have penetrated Earth's interior at South Pole and to have come out near Victoria Desert. Travers states that swarm of prehistoric beetles, estimated at two trillion, and as large as men, with shells impenetrable by rifle bullets, now besieging Settler Station, where he and Dodd and Hadia, woman of subterranean race, whom they brought away, are shut up in telegraph office. Bram, former member of Greystoke Expedition, said to be in charge of swarm, with intention of obliterating human race, every living thing at Settler Station destroyed, and swarm moving south. It was a small-town paper a hundred miles from New York that took a chance on publishing this report from the international press, in spite of frantic efforts on the parts of the head office to recall it after it had been transmitted. This paper published the account as an April Fool's Day joke, though later it took to itself the credit for having believed it. But by the time April Fool's Day dawned, all the world knew that the account was, if anything, an underestimate of the fearful things that were happening down under. It was known now that the swarm of monsters had originated in the great Victoria Desert, one of the worst stretches of desolation in the world, situated in the southeast corner of western Australia. Their numbers were incalculable. Wimbush, the aviator who was attempting to cross the continent from east to west, reported afterward that he had flown for four days, skirting the edge of the swarm, and that the whole of that time they were moving in the same direction, a thick cloud that left a trail of dense darkness on earth beneath them, like the path of an eclipse. Wimbush escaped them only because he had a ceiling of 20,000 feet, to which apparently the beetles could not soar and this swarm was only about one-fourth of the whole number of the monsters. This was the swarm that was moving westward, and subsequently totally destroying all living things in Kalgoorlie, Coolgardie, Perth, and all the coastal cities of western Australia. Ships were found drifting in the Indian Ocean, totally destitute of crews and passengers. Not even their skeletons were found and it was estimated that the voracious monsters had carried them away bodily, devoured them in the air, and dropped the remains into the water. All the world knows now how the sea elephant herd on Kirgulian Island was totally destroyed, and of the giant shells that were found lying everywhere on the deserted beaches, in positions that showed the monsters had in the end devoured one another. Mauritius was the most westerly point reached by a fraction of the swarm. A little over 20,000 of the beetles reached that lovely island, by count of the shells afterward, and all the world knows now of the desperate and successful fight that the inhabitants waged against them. Men and women, boys and girls, blacks and whites, finding that the devils were invulnerable against rifle fire, sallied forth boldly with knives and choppers, and laid down a life for a life. On the second day after their appearance, the main swarm, a trillion and a half strong, reached the line of the Transcontinental Railway, and moved eastward into South Australia, traveling, it was estimated, at the rate of two hundred miles an hour. By the next morning they were in Adelaide, a city of nearly a quarter of a million people. By nightfall, every living thing in Adelaide and the suburbs had been eaten, except for a few who succeeded in hiding in walled-up cellars or in the surrounding marshes. That night the swarm was on the borders of New South Wales and Victoria, and moving in two divisions toward Melbourne and Sydney. The northern half, it was quickly seen, was flying wild, with no particular objective, moving in a solid cohort two hundred miles in length, and devouring game, stock, and humans indiscriminately. 
It was the southern division, numbering perhaps a trillion, that was under command of Bram, and aimed at destroying Melbourne as Adelaide had been destroyed. Bram, with his eight beetle steeds, was by this time known and execrated throughout the world. He was pictured as Antichrist, and the fulfillment of the prophecies of the Rock of Revelations. And all this while, or rather until telegraph wires were cut, broken, it was discovered later, by perching beetles, Tommy Travers was sending out messages from his post at Settler's Station. Soon it was known that prodigious creatures were following in the wake of the devastating horde. Mantises, fifteen feet in height, winged things like pterodactyls, longer than bombing airplanes, followed, preying on the stragglers. But the main bodies never halted, and the inroads that the destroyers made on their numbers were insignificant. Before the swarm reached Adelaide, the Commonwealth government had taken action. Troops had been called out, and all the available airplanes in the country had been ordered to assemble at Broken Hill, New South Wales, a strategic point commanding the approaches to Sydney and Melbourne. Something like 400 airplanes were assembled, with several batteries of anti-aircraft guns that had been used in the Great War. Every amateur aviator in Australia was on the spot, with machines ranging from tiny moths to Hanley pages, anything that could fly. Nocturnal though the beetles had been, they no longer feared the light of the sun. In fact, it was ascertained later that they were blind, an opacity had formed over the crystalline lens of the eye. Blind, they were no less formidable than with their sight. They existed only to devour, and their numbers made them irresistible, no matter which way they turned. As soon as the guard of the dark cloud was sighted from Broken Hill, the airplanes went aloft. Four hundred planes, each armed with machine guns, dashed into the serried hosts, drumming out volleys of lead. In a long line extending nearly to the limits of the beetle formation, thus giving each aviator all the room he needed, the planes gave battle. The first terror that fell upon the airmen was the discovery that, even at close range, the machine-gun bullets failed to penetrate the shells. The force of the impact whirled the beetles around, drove them together in bunches, sent them groping with weaving tentacles through the air, but that was all. On the main body of the invaders no impression was made whatever. The second terror was the realization that the swarm, driven down here and there from an altitude of several hundred feet, merely resumed their progress on the ground, in a succession of gigantic leaps. Within a few minutes, instead of presenting an inflexible barrier, the line of airplanes was badly broken, each plane surrounded by swarms of the monsters. Then Bram was seen, and that was the third terror. The sight of the famous beetle steeds, four pairs abreast, with Bram reclining like a Roman emperor upon the surface of the shells. It is true, Bram had no inclination to risk his own life in battle. At the first sight of the aviators he dodged into the thick of the swarm where no bullet could reach him. Bram managed to transmit an order and the beetles drew together. Some thought afterward that it was by thought transference he effected this maneuver, for instantly the beetles, which had hitherto flown in loose order, became a solid wall, a thousand feet in height, closing in on the plains. The propellers struck them and snapped short, and as the planes went weaving down, the hideous monsters leaped into the cockpits and began their abominable meal. Not a single plane came back. Planes and skeletons, and here and there a shell of a dead beetle, itself completely devoured, were all that was found afterward. The gunners stayed at their posts till the last moment, firing round after round of shell and shrapnel, with insignificant results. Their skeletons were found not twenty paces from their guns, where the gunner's monument now stands. 
Half an hour after the flight had first been sighted, the news was being radioed to Sydney, Melbourne, and all other Australian cities, advising instant flight to sea as the only chance of safety. That radio message was cut short, and men listened and shuddered. After that came the crowding aboard all craft in the harbors, the tragedies of the Eustace, the All-Australia, the Sephoris, sunk at their moorings, the innumerable sea tragedies, the horde of fugitives that landed in New Zealand, the reign of terror when the mob got out of hand, the burning of Melbourne, the sack of Sydney. And south and eastward, like a resistless flood, the beetle swarm came pouring. Well had Bram boasted that he would make the earth a desert. A hundred miles of poisoned carcasses of sheep, extended outside Sydney's suburbs, gave the first promise of success. Long mounds of beetle shells testified to the results. Moreover, the beetles that fed on the carcasses of their fellows were in turn poisoned and died. But this was only a drop in the bucket. What counted was that the swift advance was slowing down, as if exhausted by their efforts, or else satiated with food, the beetles were doing what the soldiers did. They were digging in. Twenty-four miles from Sydney, eighteen outside of Melbourne, the advance was stayed. Volunteers who went out from those cities reported that the beetles seemed to be resting in long trenches that they had excavated, so that only their shells appeared above ground. Trees were covered with clinging beetles, every wall, every house was invisible beneath the beetle armor. Australia had a respite, perhaps only for a night or day, but still time to draw breath, time to consider, time for the shiploads of fugitives to get farther from the continent that had become a shambles. And then the cry went up, not only from Australia, but from all the world. Get Travers! 